Hello party people and welcome to Office Hours in Cabo. I am uh, usually I shoot with the video going the other direction. The ocean is right on the other side of me here. I'll give you just a quick look at that. Uh, normally I shoot in that direction. Normally I shoot over in that direction, but uh, today I don't have my normal audio gear that I would have with me. Uh, I took a little too much of the audio gear back to the United States. Uh, so as a result, I don't want to shoot the microphone at the ocean because all you're going to hear is the waves. So here you get a view of the condo complex uh, behind me instead. So let's go through the questions that you posted over at PollGab. Just as a reminder, if you want to ask questions, don't put them in the YouTube comments. Put them over at PollGab in the link in the description below. And like and subscribe for more ocean views and SQL Server knowledge. First question was from Neil. Neil asks, does putting up a giant monitor on the wall with SQL Server info like CPU, disk activity, and so forth, uh, so that non-DBAs and executives can see the status sound like a good idea, or is that just inviting trouble? So I work for a company that used to do that. Uh, we had a network operations center, or a NOC, and we had big monitors up with all kinds of displays that, among other things, it showed, for example, the number of alerts that were happening, uh, which SQL servers were down, which SQL servers had failed jobs. And what we learned pretty quickly is that there's always a failure happening somewhere. And eventually the management came to us and said, look, when we have people going through tours through the data center and the network operations center, um, we actually don't want it to look like there's failures. Whenever there's a, a, a big you know, red arrow flashing up there, we don't want people to, to be concerned. We want them to think that everything's happening or is working just fine. So could you do us a favor? We'll tell you when there are going to be visitors coming through and could you change it to be either a static display showing no errors uh, or a like point the monitoring tools at a dev server that has nothing going on? So it seems like a good idea. It doesn't really work out all that well. Uh, what I would recommend instead is that put up, if you, if you want to uh, train your developers about what's going on on the server, put up a display with SP Blitz caches results. You only need to update it like once a day, uh, but showing the most, the top 10 most resource intensive queries. Because what that do, does is as people walk past it, they go, oh, that query, that's Alice's, or that query's Bob's. And so it starts to associate which teams are using all the resources on the SQL server, and then it uh, uh, turns it into a little bit of a blame game where nobody wants to have their name up on the top of the charts and encourages people to improve their code. Uh, just out of shame, if nothing else. Next up, we have Omer, who asks, what are the possible causes for SP who is active to show a SPID with a long-running insert statement, but the SPID is in a sleeping state? Oh, it's very easy. Begin TRAN, do the insert, and don't commit. The query is sleeping because it's done, uh, but there's still an open transaction with locks. Uh, when you click on the query, you may not see begin tran, but of course that's because there may be several other queries that ran along during that transaction. So that, by far and away, that's the most common one. Next up, Theo says, does the order of include columns ever matter for a non-clustered index? No. That's all there is, it's just no. Uncle Leo asks, what are the pros and cons of using native or using third-party SQL backup over the native SQL backup? So the SQL Server's built-in backup has basically checkboxes for compres compression and encryption, but not a whole lot more dials than that. Some databases perform dramatically differently with different compression options, so you get a whole lot more dials that you can tweak for compression and encryption options in the third-party tools. You tend to get better monitoring, better log shipping, better wizards for log shipping. Uh, man, all kinds of no see out today, all kinds of bugs out here. Either that or I've had too much coffee. <laughs> uh, but the, it, a lot more fine-grained options around your backups. Um, not everybody needs that. A lot of people, frankly, a lot of people don't even test their backups, which is just kind of disappointing, but it is what it is. But if you're the kind of disciplined shop that does do things like performance tuning your backups, testing your backups, using them for log shipping, uh, then you'll usually have a better time with the third-party tools. 
Uh, table level restore, object level restore is another good one. Uh, next up, Mehdi asks, Hi Brent, auto update stats is enabled. Does the database need up to date statistics with a maintenance plan? Yes, because auto update stats only updates when about 20% of the data in the table changes. That's a dramatically simplified answer uh, for that 20% number. For the details, go to our YouTube channel and scroll down. There's a class on statistics. It's got a whole bunch of videos in it. It's totally free. It's uh, originally done by Doug Lane. And uh, so if you go watch that, it goes into more details about how statistics are updated, what those thresholds are and all that. But if uh, it takes 20% of your data to change before you get statistics updates and you have five years worth of data, well, 20% of five years is one year. You probably want statistics updates to happen more frequently than once a year. Again, I'm generalizing for the short answer. For the long answer, go watch that. It's about two, three hours worth of videos in the statistics class. DBA Mufasa asks, Hi Brent, what's your best approach for tracking table usage in SQL Server databases in order to find tables that haven't been touched for a certain amount of time? What you want to do is step back one level and say, what's the problem I'm trying to solve? If the problem you're trying to solve is getting rid of objects that are just taking up space, go about it a different way. Run spblitz index, mode equals two, sort order equals size. This will give you the largest objects inside the database. Then go ask out of those top 10, 20 largest objects, are we using those? I bet that if you go through and run that, you're gonna find one or two objects that are not getting used, whether they're indexes or whether they're tables. And then, rather than trying to tackle it from a systems perspective, go ask the users, hey, do we still need that table? Why is this index here? And then that way, with a very minimum of human interaction and error, you can have a huge difference inside of the database. I don't really care that there's a bunch of tables that are each 50 megabytes in size uh, that aren't getting touched. I just don't care because uh, they can come back to haunt you if those tables are only used once a year. I know somebody who, okay, it was me, uh, who went through and did this kind of project where I was trying to tackle usage and it turned out that one of the tables was done by a business analyst who only used it once a year. And I'm like, well, first off, you, you need a better process, but you're not, we're not backing that up every day just because you only use it once a year. Default Blame Acceptor asks, Hi Brent, could you advise a KPI that I can show non-technical folks to convince them that the SQL is not a root cause of application slowness and that they should look for a solution somewhere else instead of convincing me to restart SQL's VM? So um, again, let's zoom back a little here and ask what's the problem you're trying to solve. It sounds like they're asking you to restart the VM. So what I would say is, all right, let's just sit down for a second. If I restart the VM and it works, then we'll keep having this discussion. If I restart the VM and it doesn't work, we're never going to have this discussion again. Because otherwise, if you ask me to do something and it doesn't work, then I believe you don't know what you're talking about. And for that matter, I might as well be washing my car. So, and then do that. And here's the thing, if it's getting faster every time that you restart it, Forget the KPIs, you need to learn more about what's going on in your SQL Server, because this does happen. Very typically, it's parameter sniffing, and people just don't know about the, the uh, uh, what parameter sniffing is. And as soon as they learn that, then you're on a whole new world. Yousef asks, how do you determine the optimal auto growth size for a given SQL data file when it's running on an NVMe SAN? Well, the, the what storage it's running on doesn't really matter for data files because when you have instant file initialization turned on, uh, you can grow of any size as instantly as you want. Uh, for me, it's usually like 10 gigs. 10 gigs will get me enough that it jumps in one big increment. Um, if you find yourself tuning this that often, though, I would start to wonder, well, what's the server's really biggest problem? Step back and go look at your top weight types. Um, or, or it could be that you don't have instant file initialization turned on, and then once people know about that, then this just stops becoming a pain point. Ted Stryker says, what are the pros and cons of running spblitz first for longer periods of time, like seconds equals 300? 
is there any maximum value of sec seconds that we should stay under? Um, so the, the purpose behind seconds, the seconds parameter, is that if you have something that takes a period of time and you want to track weights while it's happening, like a specific load test, and if it takes five minutes, that's fine. Gather weight stats during that five minutes. I wouldn't automate it to go longer than 60 seconds though. If you're just like logging it somewhere to table, stick with 60 seconds. You don't need granularity. You know, if you want something that's gonna cover weight stats across an entire day in 60 second increments, go get a monitoring tool. Um, but I would ask what the problem is that you're trying to solve. Man, that's like a theme of today's questions, right? What is it that, let me rephrase it too. I don't run SP Blitz first for five minutes at a time uh, because I can't afford to wait five minutes to see what the wait stats are. Like one minute is the longest I can usually wait. Wilma asks, uh, Wilbur, Wilma asks, what is the optimal monitor size, count, and configuration for viewing large query plans in Management Studio? For me, it's just, I like using a 34 inch monitor, 34, 38 inch monitor, because it's big enough that it, uh, I, uh, I can see a lot of detail, but it doesn't overwhelm my desk. Uh, so that's the, the answer for me, is I just use one of those. Elaine says, hi Brent, what are the advantages of using VMware stretch cluster instead of always on availability groups? With VMware Stretch Cluster, you can let the storage manage the storage replication. So it keeps the bytes in sync across data centers. That's useful because it can flow in either direction. Whereas always on availability groups, always flows. Sorry about hitting the camera there, I crossed my legs. Always on availability groups, always flows from the primary to the secondary. So when you fail over in a disaster recovery type scenario, it can suck to resync back in the other direction with always on availability groups, whereas it's relatively simple with VMware stretch clusters. Having said that, that's the whole sales pitch. I don't use it. I don't know anybody who's used it in the last several years uh, because with always on availability groups, the secondaries are readable. You can back up from them. You can run check DB against them. You can run queries against them, uh, and they're also useful for corruption repair. The primary will automatically fetch pages from the secondary in most cases to automatically repair corruption without downtime. Uh, so I, I don't know anybody who's used VMware stretch clusters. I'm sh in the last, like, have put in new ones in the last, like, three, four years. Um, I'm sure that they're out there. It's just super tiny compared to the people doing always-on availability groups. TJ says, we're expecting to move from our on-premises SQL servers to Azure VMs soon. What should I benchmark on our old SQL servers that's useful to assure us that the virtual hardware in Azure is not going to leave us with worse performance than what we currently have? Super simple, backups and check DB. Every night or every week, whatever, you're already running this load test in your production servers. Go do the same exact thing over in the brand new Azure VMs that you set up with the same databases. If they run the same speed, if your backups and CheckDB run the same speed, that's not a guarantee that your workloads are going to run the same speed. However, what I find in almost every case when we go to, to, to uh, test this for the first time is that even the backups in CheckDB don't run as fast as on-premises do, and that starts a good discussion point about just how, how bad is this hardware that we configured. Ain't Lion says, I got a query tuning problem with an inner join joining some large tables to a table with zero rows. The optimizer estimates one row is going to be there anyway and does a whole lot of work without realizing there are no rows to return. I can't change the query. How do I get the optimizer to figure this out early? Ooh. Uh, so you basically have two options. Well, aside from changing the query, which is, I would argue, is the right thing to do, is you put an if exists in there at the beginning and check to see whether there are rows in the table. So one way to do it is a plan guide. You can reshape the execution plan, get the plan that you want, and then uh, pin that plan to memory so that it sticks around. 
Disadvantages of plan guides, they're notoriously difficult to implement, especially when you're trying to get a reshaped version like you're talking about now. Uh, and the instant that that query changes, like if it's a third party application, the instant that that query changes, uh, the plan will no longer apply because the, you're trying to hint a query that isn't running anymore. Another drawback with it is if there are ever any rows in that table, then that plan guide's plan might be terror bad. You know, it might end up being really poorly performing. Another way that you can do it, if you are sure that no data is ever going to match, well, the reason that the query optimizer thinks that there's one row is that because he's optimistic. He believes that if you're querying for something, there must be a row in the table. Uh, it doesn't matter if there are statistics that say there aren't any rows. Statistics can be out of date, so SQL Server builds in a little bit of fudge room. If you know there are never going to be any rows, put a constraint on the table to make sure that there are no rows. For example, look at whatever's in the WHERE clause of the query and then put a constraint on that table to make sure that there are no rows that could ever possibly match. SQL Server will evaluate that constraint and short circuit the entire query. The whole query plan will just turn into a constant scan and then you're out of there. Now, of course, if that application ever does try to insert a row, the insert will fail because of your constraint. So just be really careful when you put in constraints on databases that you can't control. Hamid says, what's the fastest way to split a comma delimited string in SQL Server 2019? Hamid, that answer is Google. Hamid, in the time that it took you to find Polgab, to type your question in and put your name, and then to wait for this to show up on YouTube. Hamid, your career will go a whole lot better for you if you learn to type in questions in Google first and then only ask questions in places like this when you can't find the answer in Google. Plus, you are causing someone else who is a real, live human being. That's me. I'm a real, live human being. You are causing me to take time out of my day to babysit and spoon-feed you answers that you could get from an automated system in less than 10 seconds. Don't waste the time of other people because you don't want me to start remembering that there's some person named Hamid who asks really stupid questions and then just immediately start disregarding every time I hear the word Hamid. You want to save your credibility, your political capital for things that you can't find answers on on Google. And on we go. Kafir says, what's the maximum size of key or include column that you would consider uh, adding to a non-clustered index? Hamid, this is a good example of something that you might want to ask a human being for their opinion rather than asking for something that's a simple fact that you could just go Google for. So Kafir, great question. Uh, to me, there's no maximum size. I've added Envercare Max, I've added JSON, I've added XML uh, uh, type columns to includes. It depends a lot on the read-write nature of the database. If the database is almost exclusively reads, meaning that there's hardly any writes, or maybe the writes are done overnight in a batch window where we have plenty of time, uh, and we don't care about database size, all we care about is query performance, I have absolutely added uh, big, giant, huge columns to, included, uh, to includes of indexes, totally. I go into much more detail about that decision process in my Mastering Index Tuning class. Thomas uh, asks, how much memory should I reserve for the operating system when I configure Mac server memory for servers with one or two terabytes of RAM? Following common recommendations, I would end up with a lot, like 256 gigs for the OS. Seems like a bit much. Um, the thing is, when you see SQL servers with a large amount of RAM, what you also tend to see is people remote desktoping into them, running things, running SSMS, running integration services, running uh, uh, all kinds of thick client applications, and their logic is, well, this server is really beefy, it won't hurt that much. 
So that's why I still continue to leave a whole lot of memory on the table for the operating system. You wouldn't believe what I've seen people do. Chrome, like 10 Windows desktop, remote desktop sessions all in at once, all kinds of nasty stuff. So if you're the kind of shop that sets up a monitoring tool to watch for the Perfmon counter for remote desktop sessions open, there's actually a Perfmon counter for that, and so that you send out an alert when it's anything other than zero and you jump in and start asking questions like, why are you RDPing into this production server? If you're that kind of shop, then by all means, leave less memory available to the operating system. But let's be honest, Thomas. You're not that kind of shop, are you? You didn't even know that that counter exists. And I bet right now, if I go look at the number of remote desktop sessions, Thomas, I bet one of them's yours. I bet you got Windows Explorer open. I bet you got Management Studio open. I bet you're watching this YouTube video right now from the SQL Server. That's what you're doing, Thomas. Log out, close your browser, and start using your desktop instead. CKI asked, management wants to create a copy of the production databases for reporting purposes. The reporting copy should be refreshed nightly with production data. The production database is on AWS Web Edition 45 gigabytes. What's the easiest way to do it? Restores. Just do a full restore every night. You're doing a full backup every night. Why not do a full restore every night as well? If you're, you didn't say this, but if you're using RDS, which is different, and just in case you are using RDS, always put that into your questions because you'll get different answers. If you're using RDS, the easy way to do it is to set up a scheduled job to run your back, run a full backup uh, over to an S3 bucket, and then you can still uh, restore from that S3 bucket onto a different SQL server as well. Uh, if, you're, if you are using RDS too, another way that you could do it is you could script uh, creation of a new RDS instance every day and then use a DNS pointer to just always point, or DNS C name, to always point to the current restore. That's way much more work though, but if you wanted to do that, that's certainly an option too. Gerald says, is it recommended to install cumulative updates automatically via regular updates or should this always be done manually? The problem with automatically applying uh, any patches to a SQL Server, doesn't matter whether it's a Windows patch or a SQL Server patch, the problem with automatically doing that is that I don't know what activity is happening on the SQL Server. I'll give you a great example. A shop that I know was doing Windows updates every Saturday at 10 p.m. They'd scripted it out across all kinds of servers in their organization. Every Saturday night at 10 p.m., the Windows patches were applied, they restarted. Well, it turned out that they, there was also the window when they were trying to do backups in CheckDB, and they didn't understand why their backups in CheckDB kept randomly, sporadically failing at different times. It was because the box was rebooting, so that's just a, you know, come on now kind of thing. Uh, and then also you want to make sure that you don't have things like cluster failovers happening just because you rebooted two of the three nodes in your cluster. Uh, for, for tiny businesses, businesses that are, let's say, just because I'm sure there are some viewers out there who have this, uh, if you're a tiny business, you only have one or two SQL servers, the company's only open 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., after hours nothing happens, uh, we'll totally automate the, those uh, things to happen as long as you're not doing it during Windows where you're doing system jobs like backup. Sure, by all means, it's totally okay. Plus, in shops like that, they tend to not have things like uh, failover clustered instances, always on availability groups, whatever. Uh, next up, Sir Galahad asks, has option fast n query hint ever gotten you across the finish line? No. That's the end of that. Uh, Buck asks, have you ever noticed the annoying issue in SSMS 18.11.1 where it doesn't maintain your query plan scroll position when you switch off that tab to another tab um, and then go back to the originally displayed plan? Is this worth submitting to feedback.azure.com? Um, I, I have all kinds of switch focus problems in Management Studio. When you switch, even just click in between windows on the same execution plan, that it'll move around randomly or it'll lose focus over in the properties tab. Is it worth submitting to feedback.azure.com? My general feeling, I posted a blog post about this 
last week or two weeks ago, kind of in satire, saying here are the top 10 uh, feedback requests on uh, feedback.azure.com. If you want to see where Microsoft is going with SQL Server, look at the top 10 feedback requests, and surely these are the things that Microsoft is going to work on. And I said that kind of in jest, because if you've been watching Microsoft's feedback sites for the last decade, it's a joke. They don't give a damn what people say inside the feedback. They'll just, your votes matter to us. No, they don't. There's been stuff that's top voted for a decade and Microsoft doesn't give a wet rag what you think about that. Uh, then, you know, when you grill the, the product team members a little closer, they're like, well, it also has to influence sales and you have to give us an example of where, no, if you don't care about votes, just remove the vote counters, just make it go away. And the other reason you know they don't care is that they keep resetting that site every couple few years and they throw away all kinds of stuff inside there. Um, so I, to me, if it's a bug and you truly care about it, spend $500 to open, I know, right? That's how much it costs. Spend $500 to open a support case with Microsoft and describe the bug. If it is a bug, then they'll refund you the $500. If it's something where you were holding it wrong, then they'll say, well, you know, here's how you were holding it wrong. What you're describing is a bug, and when they admit that it's a bug, they generally refund the $500, and then you're given like a case number or a ticket number, and like if we ever fix it, then we'll tell you about it. They ain't ever gonna fix something like that. Uh, they, and I, I kind of understand why. There are just only so many developers over at Microsoft. The precise number is four. There are four developers over at Microsoft. Strangely, they're all named Ahmad. I don't know what's going on with that. But Ahmad, 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 and Ahmad, they're really busy renaming products. That's the number one thing that Ahmad, 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 and Ahmad have to do. They have to constantly update documentation and splash screens to reflect the new names of products. For example, they were all working really hard last month to rename Azure Purview as Microsoft Purview. Those are the kinds of cutting edge things that Ahmad, 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 and Ahmad have to really focus on these days. And they don't have time for things that impede your workflow. I am going straight and directly to hell. So that's probably a good place to stop for the morning. <laughs> oh, I kill me. It's probably a good place to stop for the morning. I see it's 7:30 uh, here on uh, in Cabo San Lucas. I am going to go uh, go make myself another cup of coffee because that's cold now. Uh, and then I'm also going to record a couple other uh, office hour sessions while I'm down here. I'm flying out tomorrow. I was down here to watch, there's a skimboarding competition uh, called the Cabo Classico. I've never seen uh, skimboarding before in person, and it was on this beach uh, yesterday. Uh, it was like five days long altogether, and it's still on today. I'd never seen skimboarding in person before. I didn't know that there were prof professional competitions and amateur competitions, so I got to see professional skimboarders yesterday, and you know what? It's kind of boring. I mean, it's not really their fault, but the waves aren't that good when you're skimboarding, as opposed to like, I've seen surfers out on the North Shore of Hawaii. That is impressive. You know, the waves are huge. They're out there for long periods of time going through waves. Skimboarders, it's like the whole thing's over in like 30 seconds. And then you wait a really long time. It's not really my thing. It does look like it's fun to do. It just doesn't seem like it's all that fun to watch. So that's why you haven't uh, seen any skimboarding competitions on TV either. I have a packing back up today. Or no, uh, uh, so do film a couple of uh, more Office Hours videos. And then uh, tomorrow morning I fly back over to Vegas. I got a bunch of road trips here on the horizon. I am uh, driving across the country to go see my mom uh, and then driving to or flying to San Diego to pick up the Porsche 944 Turbo, bring that to Las Vegas. Uh, Doug DeMuro had it down in San Diego to film videos on it. And then 
uh, picking up. I got another cool new toy flying to off near Malibu uh, to go pick up that toy, and I'll uh, show you about that one once I get that. <laughs> it's really cool. Uh, so thanks for hanging out with me this morning, and I will see y'all at the next office hours. I'll leave you with the beach, I suppose. I should. Uh, how does this work? Oh no, that doesn't work. That doesn't work at all. Let's try moving the whole tripod around. I'll leave you with a little beach view of the beach there.